Mina, Konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. This is actually Saturday's message, Sunday's message, yeah. Got a day behind again. The 30 minute message, the plan is to release it tomorrow, and I know I don't have the best track record of keeping those words. So I'm acknowledging right now my fault in missing a day. I plan on making it up. And the intent is to do so, and we will see how well my word holds. That hasn't held nearly as well together as God's word held, especially in the book of Ezra. Right now we're in chapter 3, where not only did he send his people back to Judah and Jerusalem, like he said he would through the prophet Jeremiah, his temple was also rebuilt under not anyone's reign, except for the reign of Cyrus king of Persia, not under the reign of any Hebrew king. So his word's very solid, and his word endured, and the people were incredibly happy about it. We read in Ezra chapter 3 verse 11, and they, the Israelites, sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So it's good times, and did I just use my own failure as a transition into a Bible passage? I sure as heck did, because it's done, I might as well use it for something. So it's great. God's word is fulfilled. Um, the people are happy. People are shouting out loud. The temple of the Lord is getting ready to be built up again. The foundation is settled. But, verse 12, many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple. We are talking about a 70-year lapse in time here. It had been 70 years since the Israelites had gone into captivity. So they were indeed old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. My first thought is people can certainly weep when they're happy. It doesn't have to be a, you know, oh, I'm so sad. It can be, oh my gosh, I'm so happy. It can be one of those, one of those tearful times, but... The Bible makes a very clear delineation that many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. So this was not a happy weeping. This wasn't a happy cry. This was a bemoaning. This was a lament. The only thing that comes to mind, I'm like, why in the world would they be unhappy with this? They've been restored to their homeland, the temple of the God they worship, Foundation is laid, which means more, you know, the, the building itself will be raised up. All I can guess is that it simply lacked in the luster and the glory that Solomon's temple had. Um, I don't know if the specific dimensions are anywhere laid out for this new temple. I'm guessing it was not nearly as big, and the plans were not going to be nearly as magnificent as Solomon's temple was. And the fact that there were so few Israelis, that's enough. that doesn't really affect the temple so much as it affects the people, so it's not as directly related, but maybe there weren't as many people to worship, so it wasn't as big, it wasn't as glamorous, wasn't as glorious, not as many people around to enjoy it. I'm trying to think of a reason why the people would be weeping, why they, it would be a depressed, non-joyous, non-happy weeping. That's all I can come up with. What I am fairly certain of, though, is that whenever God moves, oftentimes there will be many of his people that are not happy with his move, whatever it is that he's doing. Like you look throughout the church in history as the church has moved forward, as the church has tried to take new ground, as the church has tried to new things, oftentimes more than not the biggest opponent and adversary the church faced or faced was other people from the church, other Christians. That's unfortunately that that's the church's history a lot of the times the church's forward movement is opposed most strongly by the church itself people should be rejoicing they should be happy god's moving it may not be quite what they're used to it may not be what happened back in the day but god's moving <clears throat> and sometimes at least historically from the church's perspective sometimes the problem was it was a new thing God wasn't moving in the way he used to, so the older Christians had a problem with that. That's a whole new message for a whole new time. At the same time, uh, you know, that's encour encouragement to me and encouragement to my other Christians. Sometimes when other Christians oppose you, they're being used for the devil's work. 
they're not following God the way they should. They're not seeing it from his perspective. And yet he does judge his house. Yes, he does take care of his own. He also disciplines those that he loves. And sometimes that discipline comes in the form of one of his new moves. And they're not breaking out of their old ways. They're not breaking out of the habits that they have already pre-established. And sometimes they're simply living in sin. And they're not following their father and their shepherd like they should. So a lot of the times when we try to do what God wants us to do, the opposition is going to come from our family, our loved ones, our friends. Or at the very least, the people that we go to church with. And at times like that, have faith in what you know to be true. Have faith in the Word of God. Have faith in your relationship with God. If you're in sin, yeah, you need to repent. And, you, and even if you're not in sin, you always need to be open to a second point of view, to a set of thoughts that aren't quite your own, that don't quite line up with everything you believe in. Because we're humans, we can be wrong. And sometimes the greatest fear is clinging to what we definitely know, to what we're definitely used to, to what we definitely know is right. Sometimes the, de the definite, I've got it, I'm in the truth, I'm right, there's no way I could be wrong, sometimes that's the greatest nemesis of all. So take that for what it's worth, guys. It's hard to consider the fact that one one's self may be deceived, but it's a consideration we should take at all times because we are human. We're finite, we're sinful, we're limited, and we can be. So guys, thank you very much for watching this video. Hopefully this was encouraging and, if necessary, corrective. Uh, God knows I need plenty of correction. I'm the one releasing the late video here, so I pl need plenty of correction in my life, myself, and hopefully I will be open to it when it comes my way. Guys, thank you for watching this video. I love you, and God bless.